worship. Thank you for joining us here in this room at home. It is great to be together on this on this wonderful day. Uh, there's a couple things I'd like to bring to your attention before we continue on together. First, if you could pull out the Connect card that's in the pew in front of you, just let us know you're here. If you have any changes in your information or if you have any prayer requests, uh, please let us know either something that's heavy on your heart or something that you would like to celebrate with us. Let us know. We'd love praying over these. It's a privilege uh, to be able to support y'all in prayer uh, every week. Um, also, uh, there are many ways, if you came prepared to give a gift this morning uh, to support the ministry here at Kent Cove, you can do so in the blue baskets on your way out. Also, there are lots of ways online to do that as well. You can see those on your screen. Or you can also go to kentcove.org uh, for information about how to do that. Uh, a couple of things that are coming up in the life of our church. Um, right now, going on in the month of December, we are having a sock drive. It is cold and wet out, and we want to do what we can to help uh, people that are um, that might not be able to afford socks and keep their feet warm. And so if you want to bring some new or very gently used socks, you can bring them here on Sundays. There's bins out in the foyer. You can drop them by the church office all through the month of December as a great way to help those in our community who need it. Also in this month of December, um, we are asking you all to opt into our new communications, which are going to be starting January 1st. So if you have not already done that, please do that. Go to cantcove.org. There's, there's an announcement there that allows you to opt into communication so you can receive things like our weekly email. If you have kids, emails about kids programs, youth about youth programs. Um, it, it, we, it would be great for y'all to do that so we can stay in communication with one another because we want to make sure y'all know what is going on because um, that's important for us. Uh, so please go do that at cancove.org if you haven't already. Even if you're currently getting the weekly email, you still need to go opt into the new communications thing because we're changing how we send that email, which is why we're asking everyone to, to opt into that communication. Also, exciting event happening tonight is our Christmas-themed open mic night. The open mic night, we do the second Sunday of every month, and this being December, everything is going to be Christmas-themed, and I'm super excited. Uh, I would love for you all to... Join us to enjoy some Christmas music, poetry, readings, art, whatever people bring, uh, we are going to enjoy. Uh, it's a great way to support the artists in our church family uh, and just enjoy time together. We made a whole bunch of cookies. We're going to have cocoa. It's going to be a fun night. It's at 730 in the Fireside Cafe tonight. We'd love to see you there. Also, next Wednesday, uh, the 21st, which happens to be the longest night of the year. Uh, we are having, again, our blue Christmas service. Uh, for many people, um, the holidays is a really challenging time, especially if you've recently experienced loss. Uh, and we want to acknowledge that and give you a space uh, to experience God in the pain of this season, um, if that's where you are. And the blue service, the blue Christmas service, uh, is a service designed to come together to recognize the difficulty of this year and to still see uh, what it means to welcome Jesus into our pain this Christmas season. And so that is going to be next Wednesday night, the 21st, also in the Fireside Cafe. It will also be streamed online um, if that is uh, helpful for you. Um, and also during this Advent season, we are, as a church, supporting uh, some exciting things uh, through the Paul Carlson partnership, and to hear a little bit more about that, we have Ann Higginson. Let's welcome Ann. Good morning, Kent Cove. It's just my, my honor to bring this opportunity before you. Since my return home from Congo, I've actually struggled quite a bit, um, just with the thought that we still have starving children in the 21st century. It's just hard to believe with all our resources and all our wealth that this is a problem we still are dealing with. But last week, thank you, Pastor Corey, for illuminating Isaiah 11. It really unfolded God's heart, didn't it? Did you feel that last week? that we don't have to carry the weight of the world, that God has that weight, but it's our responsibility to walk out that kingdom life and to 
provide for the poor, for the oppressed, for the unjust things that happen in this world. So thanks for really bringing that to life because I really realized that's the weight I was carrying, like I was carrying it, and I don't have to carry it because all of my brothers and sisters are helping, everybody around the world is helping. And I called the doctor actually that also has had trouble since we've been home and I said, read Isaiah 11. <laughs> and we have help. So um, the Congolese see death every day. Um, unfortunately, malnutrition is at an all time high at 18%. That means 18 kids out of 100 die of malnutrition in their area. That's very high. The national, or not national, but the World Health Organization standard is 5%. So the Congolese asked us a year ago to walk with them and help them with this problem. And I have a table out front that you can come and see, and we have developed a curriculum with them in partnership with them. And now the big hurdle is the supplies um, because it takes special vitamin packets to add to formula, to make the formula, to make the plumpy nut out of peanuts and protein. They're very low in protein. <clears throat> and also we have Pedialyte um, for when you're dehydrated or maybe you get a Gatorade and you wash that down, they, they, can't, they have to buy all this from Europe. So that's why it's so costly, too. It's not something that Africa can produce. So this year, the Advent um, offering is including that um, in our offering. We've made a card so that if you donate and want to honor somebody and give them a gift and say, here's a gift, of meaning, here's a gift of um, where we can touch the whole world. Well, you can write a note to your family. I know as um, a parent of adult children, as grandparent, I'm not a great grandparent yet, but I hope someday I get that pleasure of being a great grandparent and being able to speak that legacy into them of how to give, how to stand with the world, how to stand with the poor and the oppressed. So I'll see you at the back and thank you for giving. Thank you, Anne. Like she said, she'll be in the foyer if you want more information about how to support that project that's happening in Congo. Uh, you can go talk to her afterwards. Um, so today we are in the third, or today is the third Sunday of Advent which uh, traditionally has been the week of joy. As we look forward to Christ's coming, the joyous news of God becoming one of us, and we get to celebrate that joy, that reality today. And as we prepare ourselves to do that, I just want to acknowledge that uh, not all of us in this room are feeling joy right now, and that is true, and that is real, uh, and that's okay. Um, the joy of the Lord is one that is deeper and higher than our circumstances. Um, if we don't feel joy, it is still possible to have joy. I'm reminded of uh, in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, uh, C.S. Lewis is this wonderful story. Uh, that there's talk of a deeper magic that's deeper than the magic of the white witch. Um, and, and that image of something deeper, more true than what we can see, uh, is what this joy is about. It's not something that makes us feel happy all the time, but it is something that gives us buoyancy. It is something that energizes us. It is something that is a gift from God, not something we can produce. And so as we celebrate joy, the joy of Jesus' birth that we look forward to, um, whether it is something you're currently feeling or not, we can sing these words. We can say these things together with honesty, with integrity, knowing that the source of our joy is that deeper magic, not magic is the wrong word in this case, that deeper strength, this gift from the Spirit um, that transcends our 
circumstances. So I invite you to stand as we sing, enjoy this morning, um, and feel free, if it is helpful for you, to move around, clap your hands, get a little rowdy, it's okay. Um, it's a joyous morning.
as a family, as your church to worship, to praise, to respond to your good word, your good message with joy. So, Father, we thank you for your presence here, your spirit that is moving among us in this place. Thank you for your love, for your hope and peace and joy that we uh, get to explore this morning. And we are grateful for your presence here today. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can go ahead, go ahead and have a seat for a moment. And as you do, I'd like to invite up uh, Jean Peterson and Angela Nieto. Uh, we, as a church, as, as we've been walking through Advent, uh, have asked some of our newest members, uh, people who have joined the church, uh, to come and lead us in these Advent readings and lighting of the candles. And so we have uh, Jean and Angela to do that for us today. Let's welcome them. My name is Jean Peterson. Uh, my wife, Margie Peterson, couldn't be here today. Uh, she has a kind of a serious cold. And if you're watching at home, get better. <laughs> Hi, I'm Angela Nieto. I'm a fairly new member of Kent Covenant, I'm a, and I'm happy to be here. <laughs> okay, today we continue our journey through Advent by lighting the candles of hope, peace, and joy. In a world that is dark and broken, the light of Christ's advent reminds us of the truth that the kingdom of God is at hand and someday soon all things will be made right and will somehow be more beautiful for having once been broken. This is the good news of the gospel, which in the words of the hymn is joy to those who long to hear it. The silence has, is being broken. The light, of, the light shatters the darkness. The hope of the world has come. Rejoice, Emmanuel, God is coming to live with us. Hear these words from the prophet Isaiah. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. The wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor no ravenous beast. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there. And those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing, everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Please pray with me. Gracious Father, we thank you for this season of joy. As we wait for the full presence of your kingdom, remind us of the joy of your incarnation and restore us unto the joy of our salvation. When the circumstances of our lives tempt us to despair, fill us with your joy, which transcends our troubles and leads us to worship. We cannot do this by our own strength, so we ask for your spirit to empower us, to fill us with your joy, and to lead us onward to a life of hope, peace, and joy. Amen. Amen. Come, you people of the promise, sing for joy, the time is near. God, the covenant fulfilling, soon among us will appear. As proclaimed in prophet's story, Christ will come. Great. Yeah. 
church. It's good to see you all this morning. I want to invite up our PDR teachers and our PDR students that are here today with us. We have a very special morning today. Yeah, you can clap for them. <laughs> Share some of that Advent joy. It's awesome. Well, today's a very special day for us um, where we get to present um, Bibles to our students. Um, many of you guys have heard of PDR. It stands for Project Deep Roots. It's our discipleship confirmation journey that our Kent Cove youth um, choose to enter into. This year we have six students that have committed their time to learning about the Old Testament. Our youth are called the heritage of the Lord. Their value is unmatched. And so it is clear through scripture that their education is of utmost importance. PDR is designed to be a systematic exploration of God's word. It is a way where we enter into history and learn about our faith journey and the importance of living a Christ-centered life. This year, we will enter into this journey emphasizing also the importance of developing relationship that will invest in their faith for years to come, we hope. And so we have asked several of you to, to walk alongside these students as mentors. We're so grateful for that. We encourage you as the church to not be just spectators of these beautiful human beings, but that you would enter into their lives, get to know them, share your faith journey with them, pray for them. And then we also have the beautiful relationship of journeying alongside our pastors and our staff here. But especially, we are so blessed to have our PDR teachers, Jeff Strobel and Radina Edgar, who said yes to serving in, in this capacity of pouring out their own lives, their faith, and their wisdom and knowledge of the scriptures that they have learned along the way. So not only will our students learn what the Bible says, but they will learn what biblical faith means to be translated into our Christian faith as a responsibility of living out in this world. So as you can see on this table, we have Bibles for our students. These Bibles reveal the character of God, the nature of God, his sovereignty and his power and his reason for creating us. This book is holy and this book is sacred. And so I pray that as you receive these Bibles today, you would really truly understand the gift that it is to have these words in your hand. So today we present these Bibles to each of our students as a sacred tool for the journey ahead. And so I present these Bibles to Adam Johnson, to Caroline Scobie, and to Joanna Allard. And we also will present these Bibles to James Allard, Joseph Henry, and Hannah Crone, who couldn't be here today. So you can pass them out. Awesome. I would typically invite you as a church to come forward, to lay hands, especially friends and mentors. But because of COVID, I'm going to ask you to stay in your seats and just stretch your hands out as a blessing over these students. Um, church, I ask that this wouldn't just be a special moment that we have here on Sunday morning, but that you would continue to commit to journey with these students, to look at them, to greet them in these hallways as they pass through, to pray for them, to share of your own faith journey, to be people, safe people, to ask those hard questions of faith. Um, we're really grateful for you. And so as a sign of commitment to these students and to those who couldn't be here today, would you just raise your hands as Jeff prays over these students? Please join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, you who are our dearest Lord, we thank you for giving us life, our ability to read and understand, and inspiring some people so long ago, your chosen people, the Hebrews, to write down these experiences of you in the scriptures, in the Bible. 
so that future generations, that our generation, that this new generation, would remember your actions of salvation, of justice, and love. We ask for your blessing on the reading of these Bibles. Empower these students to love you with heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love one another as Jesus, you love us. For we know that all the law, all the ex exhortations to justice by the prophets contained in these scriptures are for the purpose of love. To know, to deeply know that we are loved by you. And then to go forth, to go into our daily life and practice that love in our grateful response. We ask for your guidance and inspiration of your Holy Spirit throughout the years as these students read these Bibles. We pray all of this in Jesus, your precious name. Amen. the main cast of the Christmas story. We've got Mary and Joseph, and of course, baby Jesus. But when Luke sat down to write his account of Christmas, he made sure to mention an unlikely group of people. They were sheep farmers or shepherds. And at that time, they were overlooked and avoided. Nobody thought they deserved attention. The night Jesus was born, the shepherds were watching their sheep do whatever sheep do at night. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared to them. This was terrifying. The shepherds and their flocks were speechless. Seeing them tremble, the angels said, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. In other words, chill out. I've got a special message and I need you to share. Their jaws dropped. Not only was an angel singing to them, but they rarely got asked to do anything important. The angel continued and gave them specific details on how to find Jesus in the crowded town of Bethlehem. They jotted down Bethlehem, Savior, Baby, Manger on whatever shepherds quickly ride on. Then it got kicked up a notch. The angel's song hit a crescendo and the sky filled with a huge angel choir. The shepherds rocked out to a song like no other. When the angels left, the shepherds looked around and said, you heard the song, let's head to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. Because when an angel says go, you go. They went to Bethlehem, saw Jesus had arrived, met his sweet parents, and went out to tell everyone they knew the Savior was born. Everyone was amazed by the story the shepherds told. When God wrote his musical birth announcement, he didn't deliver it to popular celebrities or the local news. He gave his song to average shepherds who were minding their own business head down and rejected. He wanted forgotten people to be the first to hear the good news. Jesus is here. That is good news for all of us. Um, at this point, actually, before I uh, have the kids go to their classes, just a quick note that next Sunday, families, parents, grown-ups, um, if you have kids in our program, you're going to take them directly up to Kids Church, not bring them in here at the beginning of the service. I just want to let you know that that's coming next week. Uh, they're going to help create something for our Christmas Eve service next week. And so uh, if you have kids in our program, take them directly to Kids Church next Sunday, the 18th. Cool? All right, now I'd like to invite our kids to head back to these doors, to head up with their helpers as they go to their workshop. And as they go to church, let's sing this blessing over them. Go with God to play your part in his story. Go with power bearers of God's glory. Go with peace to love and serve and heal. Go with love and show the Kent Cove. Good to see you all. Good to be here this morning. I do need to make a little editorial comment, a little retraction or correction from my last week's sermon. Um, yeah, it happens. Sometimes, you know, even preachers misspeak. I know that's shocking to you. 
but I ascribed the wrong name to the wrong empire when I was talking about the prophet Isaiah last week. It's the empire of Assyria, not Babylon. Two different empires, same spirit, okay? So um, just want to clear that up. But uh, this morning we continue to talk about Isaiah's predictions or uh, descriptions of this day that would come, the Messiah, and um, we're going to look into that in just a moment. So please join me in prayer. Bless us this day, O Lord, with vision. May this place be a sacred place, a telling space, where heaven and earth meet. Amen. You know, I love to preach from Isaiah, and sometimes I feel like we could just read Isaiah with no comment and allow that to just, to allow ourselves to just steep in those words because they really oftentimes don't require a lot of explanation. The beauty and the richness of them speaks for itself. But this morning we're going to talk about the passage that we heard in our Advent reading, but there are some phrases that pop out as we hear this beautiful description of what will happen when God's kingdom comes in fullness and when this Messiah um, brings about what it is that God has promised. Isaiah talks about the desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom like the crocus It will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. And then he goes on to describe how this will happen and what this will look like. But that image of flowers bursting into bloom and all of creation shouting for joy. But as Peter named already this morning... Sometimes in this dark winter season, especially with the way that we like to play with the clock, um, it can be hard to feel joy. And, um, And we recognize that oftentimes we long, just as the Israelites did, for that day when all things will be made right when the world is as god intended when nature demonstrates and sings a hymn of praise all around us but i recognize that that can be hard to experience especially in the dark of winter and in a season when sometimes you know, the, the brokenness of our relationships is maybe unintentionally paraded in front of our eyes over and over again through the talk of family and gatherings and all of that kind of stuff. But it made me think of uh, this kind of unusual experience that I had years ago when I discovered one of the most freeing questions that I know. Are you ready? Here it is. What's the worst that could happen? Now, on the face of it, that doesn't seem like that great of a question. It seems kind of defeatist almost. But here's the trick. The reality is is that when we ask that question and we actually think through and name what the actual worst thing or imagined worst thing that could happen is, naming it brings it into the light And the light brings freedom because we recognize that we've now named what the worst thing actually is. And like sometimes as children naming that monster under the bed, it kind of robs it of its power. I first heard this question or I first remember kind of being freed by this question when I was pastoring a small church that had been struggling for years to get traction And we brought in uh, this consultant, and this is the question that he asked us, and we started naming the things. Well, we could do, you know, this, that, and the other thing could happen. And at first, it was, there was this heaviness in the room. 
But as the conversation went on, all of a sudden that heaviness started to lift. Because by naming it, it no longer captured that real estate in our hearts. And I think that's part of what it is that happens when we read these texts from Isaiah and we hear this beautiful, this beautiful imagery that Isaiah gives us of how um, even the, the, the very environment around us is going to bloom and we're going to experience deserts flourishing. We're going to imagine oceans restored. We're going to see forests flourish. We're going to see degradation reversed. And in the midst of that, we're going to experience freedom from some of those things that kind of capture us through fear. Now, a little context. If uh, one of the temptations that we face as we look at these verses is um, we tend to go to Isaiah's, the beautiful poetry, and we, we go over the bleak poetry. So what Isaiah does and is masterful at is Isaiah alternates between super bleak, hardcore judgment and the kind of imagery that we read this morning. So we read this morning th Isaiah 35 verses 1 through 10 and it gives this beautiful imagery of the wasteland, the wilderness becoming a, a beautiful oasis. It gives the imagery of the deaf hearing, the blind seeing, um, speaking strength to the feeble need, all of these beautiful images. But the only way that that's really powerful is if you recognize that in verse 34, Isaiah has just announced judgment against Israel. And not just a little bit of judgment. Not just a, you've been bad people, and you're going to have a time out. No, this is bleak, biblical proportion judgment. God is going to lay waste to you as a nation. Right? Remember we talked about the stump of Jesse? This is not just God giving a time out. This is severe judgment for the failures that um, Israel has fallen into. Which, you know, if you want to get into that, it's failures that sound very, very familiar to us. It's a failure to care for the weak and the poor. It's a, it's a failure to recognize the image of God in all people and to favor the rich and the powerful. All of these things that are very familiar to us. Isaiah in verses 4 and 5, well 3, 4, and 5, gives this beautiful picture. He says that we should strengthen the feeble hands. Steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like deer and the mute tongue shout for joy, water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sands will become a pool. The thirsty ground bubbling springs. And he goes on to, de to continue to describe the way that God will restore these things. But I love this command. Strengthen the feeble hands. Steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. Now, as we've already established, there's something important that needs to happen here that oftentimes for us is, in, is uncomfortable. And that is in order for us to speak um, to the feeble-hearted, 
to announce this kind of joy and hope that Isaiah is talking about, we have to name that fear. This idea that Isaiah gives, say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. You know, I think sometimes we hear that and we, and we want to jump right there. We want to we go to those who are struggling and just say, don't fear. But it's not really quite that simple, is it? For those of us who have experienced depression or anxiety or whatever, and, or just hard circumstances in life, um, it, it can feel very disingenuous when people come and say, well, you, you have nothing to fear. Really? I, I'm reminded of years ago, there's a, um, a skit on Mad TV they brought Bob New, Newhart back, and he played this therapist, and, and um, I won't do the whole thing, but basically his thing was, um, his response to everything was, stop it. <laughs> so this woman comes to him, and she's afraid of being buried in a box, and, and his response is, stop it. Just stop. And sometimes I think we read verses like this, and we hear Isaiah say, you know, S- just tell people to stop. Just stop it. Don't you know the joy of the Lord? But I think Isaiah recognizes that first you have to name the thing. And you have to experience the judgment. That's why when he uh, continues in this verse and he says your God will come, he doesn't stop there. He says he will come with vengeance and divine retribution. He will come to save you. But brothers and sisters, in the saving there is judgment. The only way that we can know the joy of the Lord is to know that we only receive it by grace. And that part of receiving it is naming those fears. Because Isaiah recognizes why should we speak joy and hope to those who have fear in their hearts? It's because fear prevents Right? There's a reason that one of the most um, often commanded things in the Bible is fear not. Even in the Christmas story that we're moving towards, when the angels come and they announce the best news that has ever been spoken, the first thing they have to say is fear not. Fear in the heart prevents us from being able to to have hands and feet that work for God. And we recognize, I think especially in this season, after the years that we have just passed through as a world, that there are things to fear that we didn't even know about a few years ago. And yet... We speak hope and joy to fearful hearts. Isaiah presents this compelling picture of a world where all has been made right. A world where the weak have been strengthened, where infirmities are restored, where wilderness and desert is transformed into a place, an oasis, where there is water and rest and sustenance. He gives an image of a place where there is a highway where only the redeemed can walk. And it's a beautiful, powerful image. And it creates this image and calls us to understand our theme for this morning, which is joy, which is such a rich idea, but it's often not what we think it is, right? Oftentimes we think of joy and we think of feelings of happiness. We think of, you know, if, if Christmas is joy, it's little children laughing and presents under the tree and blah, 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 and it's like, Yes, it is those things, but that's the least of it. You see, joy is that deep assurance 
that God is going to do exactly what Isaiah describes in this passage. Joy is that deep assurance even in the midst of the wilderness. Because Isaiah was not speaking to people who had experienced what he was describing. He's speaking to people who are in the midst of judgment and brokenness. He's speaking to those who are blind and deaf and broken. And he's saying that God will come and restore you. And that, friends, is the joy that we speak of. Frederick Buechner writes in The Longing for Home, gives this description of joy. He writes, joy is home. God created us in joy and created us for joy. And in the long run, not all the darkness there is in the world and in ourselves can separate us finally from that joy. Because whatever else it means to say that God created us in his image, I think it means that even when we cannot believe in him, even when we feel most spiritually bankrupt and deserted by him, his mark is deep within us. We have God's joy in our blood. That, friends, is the image of joy. That is what it means as we walk through Advent and we continue to wait for that day when God will do all the things that are described in this beautiful passage. And yet we name the fact that we do not experience it yet. We still experience brokenness. We experience it in our own lives, in our own relationships, in our own bodies. And we experience it in the broken and malnourished bodies of our brothers and sisters in the Congo. And we experience it in the brokenness of war and violence and on and on and on. And we long for that day that Isaiah describes. And we long for it with joy. The image that we have been using this Advent in our, here at Kent Cub, is from the Japanese art of Kintsuji. And it's basically the art of broken things. If you go on YouTube, you can find all kinds of beautiful examples of this amazing art, but essentially it's taking broken uh, pieces of pottery and china and different things and, and fixing it with gold. And oftentimes, if not all the time, the, the restored pieces are more beautiful than the original ever was because of the, the beautiful patterns of the cracks where they're mended. There is joy in seeing something that was broken, made not simply useful again, but beautiful. You see, so often we stop at useful. That's hardwired into us as, uh, as can-do Americans, right? It's all, about, it's all about usefulness. But not to God. For God, it's all about beauty. Usefulness is, is secondary almost. God takes these broken things and he restores them. This text recalls to us a God that is a God of restoration. He takes broken wastelands and brings restoration, replacing fear with joy. As we come ever closer to Jesus, may we experience the joy of his coming, which brings wholeness to a broken and hurting world. And may we live with joy as we seek and we await that day when we will experience in fullness the, wor the world that Isaiah describes in these verses. 
A world where the land itself rejoices. A world where the blind, the deaf, and the lame rejoice and are restored. A world where Zion is recovered and restored. A place of pure, undiminished, unqualified well-being that is the shalom of God. Friends, that is the world that we wait for. That is the world that as we walk through Advent, we wait for Jesus to come again and to bring about. That is the world that Jesus invites us to be working towards while we wait. And it is a world filled with joy. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you for the promises, the ancient promises of scripture. And God, we long with your people through the ages for that day when we will see a world made new through the power of the resurrected Christ. And God, we long for the day when we will experience that wholeness, that shalom, in not only our world, but in our own lives. And so God, now in this moment of silence, we name those places where we have not and do not experience that wholeness asking that you would take away our fear, that you would strengthen our feeble knees. And you would stir that joy in our hearts. We ask it in the name of our Lord and coming King. Amen. Amen. As our time this morning comes to a close, I I invite you to stand and join us as we sing. Probably one of my favorite songs ever written. We can sing with joy. It's a good thing.
Friends, if you find yourself in need or in want of prayer, we have one of our prayer team members right here under the sign. She would love to pray with you this morning. Brothers and sisters, go now in joy, knowing that you are loved by God the Father. You have been redeemed by the grace of Jesus Christ, and you are empowered to share that love and grace with a broken and hurting world. Go in peace and joy.